overview of what my research is today, um, and then talk about how research preparation made that made that possible. Uh, so, so I'm interested. Our lab is interested in soft, squishy materials. So those 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 things that aren't quite solid, aren't quite fluids. Um, and you know things they're they're kind of everywhere. You know, think about the shampoo you use, or or the soap, or paint, or in athletics, all the gel cushioning and protective wear. Um, I'm also a football fan, <laughs> um, and you know adhesives. All of these things that are kind of like goopy and slimy. Um, we don't really understand a lot about how these materials behave. Um, and the one thing that, that these materials have in common is that they're all made of polymers, these long stringy molecules. And so they have this, the, the, they have this viscoelastic properties where they're not quite solid-like and they're not quite fluid-like. Um, so what I'm interested in understanding is what's happening at a molecular level to create this, um, to create this interesting behavior. Um, and then how can we, from understanding that, how can we use that to create new materials um, with, you know, with tunable properties? And so, uh, so these viscoelastic materials have visco have this, um, these interesting properties at a macroscopic level. So if anyone's mixed cornstarch and water and you make this oobleck, right? So if you put it on the speaker, it'll do this nice dancing trick. Um, so that's viscoelasticity. Um, so I want to zoom in, say what's happening closer to, um, down to see what's uh, to give rise to this. So if you zoom in a little bit, you get something that looks kind of like a big bowl of spaghetti. Um, but even that is really complicated, right? You try to pull on one strand of spaghetti and a lot of it will pull out. Maybe you can string one through. So again, spaghetti, a bowl of spaghetti, it's not quite solid, it's not quite fluid. Um, but then this is still really complicated. So I want to zoom in even, even further um, to a molecular level. So what's happening at this scale, how does how do how does one polymer interact with another polymer to create these um, these interesting properties? And then how can we vary the properties of the polymers and their interactions to create different um, different material properties? All right. So how do how does my lab do this? Um, well, we use biopolymers to answer these questions because biology has done a lot of work for us. Biology is very good at making polymers with very defined lengths and, um, and sizes and properties, so we can use them. So, so three, three important biopolymers that I use, uh, DNA, which is fairly flexible, so we use very long strands of DNA, and their, their persistence length is like 50 nanometers, so you can have thousands and thousands of persistence lengths in a, um, in a strand of DNA. And just by replication in cells, you can get very exact lengths. And those can range you know, over um, orders of magnitude in length. Um, and you can also control the topology of DNA. So you not just have these long string molecules that are linear, but you can have supercoiled structures and ring structures. And so you can imagine if you have a bowl full of ring spaghetti, it's going to act a lot differently than a bowl full of linear spaghetti or supercoiled. Um, and now in actin, in microtubules, which comprise the cytoskeleton of our cells, uh, actin is semi-flexible, so the persistence length is about the size of its length, um, so it's kind of like a garden hose. Um, and microtubules are really rigid. You know, their persistence length is a millimeter, and our cells are, you know, on the order of 100 microns. Um, and you can control their lengths just by, the different by their polymerization conditions. Um, and you can also introduce crosslinkers into these networks of um, of actin and situs of actin and microtubules to create different um, different rigidities and different properties of these of these structures. And the, and what we the tools we use to to measure this. So again, I said I was interested in the molecular level. What's happening? How does each polymer interact with an, with one another? So we use microscopic techniques. So one of them is optical tweezers microbiology. So optical tweezers. If you, if you take a laser and, and um, you can find it to a tight point, um, you can trap tiny particles inside your, your polymer mixture and then move them and have them you know, hit up against one of the polymers and see what's, what, measure what is the force um, that they're resisting, what are the, the force they're exerting to resist that strain. Um, and you can do these, um, you can do lots of different um, cool measurements with this. And then we, if, we, if we introduce fluorescent labeling too, we can ask, well, we can measure the force at the molecular level, but then also what are the molecules doing themselves to give rise to this force? So here's where we introduce fluorescence microscopy. Um, and another 
important part of my lab is that undergraduates are really the bread and butter of the lab. They do they do the um, the really heavy lifting. Um, so we don't have a graduate program at USD, and so all this work is done um, mostly by by undergraduates. Um, and this is something that Research Corporation has been very supportive of. Um, so again, so how did Research Corporation make um, make this possible? Uh, so my first grant um, when I started at USD was um, was a, the Cottrell College Award. Um, I, so I started in the fall of 2009, and I um, and I got this award in 2010. Um, and here's the title: elucidating the it's too long, in my opinion. Now looking back, <laughs> um, elucidating the molecular dynamics, conformations, and interactions occurring in complex DNA systems via novel single molecule techniques. I wanted to shove everything in there that I was trying to do. Um, but what the what the proposal was was basically to build this optical tweezers, but to incorporate fluorescence um, fluorescence microscopy. So to basically take fluorescence a fluorescence microscope and an optical tweezers and combine them into one. And so this hadn't really been been done before. And I had this this great idea where I could um, you know have a DNA strand and have fluorescent labels labels in, labels in there and then if I move this strand I could see I could measure the force and then also see what the molecules doing to to give rise to this force so it was just one very simple technique that I wanted to carry out but it required building this this instrument um, and then from using this technique I wanted to understand um, the 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 physics behind blends of ring and linear DNA so this was this was the proposal, um, and with the with the funding from the Cottrell College Award and some of my some of my startup, I was able to build this this instrument, um, and and develop the technique, and I was able to publish a couple papers on these on these ring linear blends, and so from that um, having this having this instrument and a couple publications um, that introduced that was allowed me to apply for. Um, to more funding, so I, I in 2012 I was able to get an Air Force Young Investigator Award um, to basically build on. So now that I had this instrument and uh, you know I developed this one technique, I wanted to really think what could I do with this instrument? What what there's so many different things, um, so many different types of measurements that could be done. And so this Air Force um, grant, a lot of it was to develop the the whole field of um, of optical tweezers microrheology more and how we could and how we could um, couple fluorescence. With with optical tweezers microbiology, um, and the focus of was on again looking more at these blends, and so so from this from this Air Force Young Investigator Award, I was able to um, develop some more of the techniques using this um, using this instrument, um, and with that, I was able to um, to get a career award in 2013, and the career award again was developed was technique development, but it was really taking a turn. So my, my graduate work and my beginning work was all working with DNA. Um, but I knew the cytoskeleton had all of these, had these interesting biopolymers, had actin and had microtubules. And I thought if we could somehow, uh, if I could somehow start working with those, you know, we could really expand what we could understand about, um, what we could understand about uh, soft materials. And so this was uh, so the career proposal, the career award was really to start working with actin and try, trying to create these new materials with actin filaments. Um, uh, and so I was able to um, uh, publish some papers um, with both on both the cytoskeleton and with the DNA and developing this this interesting technique. I was able to form some collaborations. Um, and then I was invited to be a part of um, the Research Corporation and uh, Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation Molecules Come to Life Scilog in 2015. Um, and this again, speaking of the imposter syndrome, this was something, you know, um, Richard said, you know, you should apply for this. And it's, it's the Molecules Come to Life was all about understanding, you know, um, what's happening at a molecular level to give rise to life. Um, but I thought, you know, my research was really more polymer physics. I was using biopolymers, but I don't know anything about the cell. I don't know anything. No, 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 just, just do it anyway. So I said, I, uh, okay. So I submitted my application, and um, and I ended up going, and it was it was an it was an amazing experience. Silogs are awesome, um, and I formed um, I I formed this great collaboration. Um, so part of the silogs are um, you they they put you in groups of of two or three or four people that you don't know, and you're supposed to in 15 minutes come up with some crazy idea of how you could combine all your research to do something. 
Um, and so that's where I met uh, Jenny Ross, who's at Syracuse University, and Mike Rust. Um, she's in the physics, and Mike Rust in the biology to, at University of Chicago. And um, Jenny was an expert with microtubules. And again, I had um, I hadn't had any experience with microtubules. I had I had worked with DNA and with actin, and she was also um, an expert in single molecule microscopy. And um, Mike Rust uh, was an expert in um, uh, bacterial circadian oscillator systems. Um, so these clock proteins that, um, and he was he he had figured out how he could actually recreate these clock proteins um, in vitro and get um, get circadian rhythms um, outside of cells. And so we came up with this crazy idea um, to create a creepy crawling material. Um, so this material that basically, if we incorporated the circadian oscillators into a cytoskeleton. Um, into a cytoskeleton scaffold made with actin and microtubules that then the circadian oscillator could basically cause, um, cause the material to contract and expand or soften and stiffen um, in a very uh, periodic manner. And if you do this in a periodic manner, you can imagine it could crawl. Um, so this was, this was our idea. Um, and uh, we got some seed money from, um, from through the Scilog. So part of the Scilog is you could apply for these, um, these grants. And then you could, so, we, so the first year we each got about $50,000 to work on this crazy idea. And then the second year we could apply for a second year of funding. And because we had made a little progress, um, they gave us more funding to keep, to keep pursuing this. So this was, really, um, this was a really fun project. Um, and not only, I mean, it was a great, it was forming great collaboration, but we actually were able to make some progress. And again, just the, it was able to expand, um, expand what my lab was able to do. Uh, and so part of this, a branch off of this work was, you know, getting, getting expertise in microtubules now. Um, I was uh, able to get a, um, an NIH R15 grant. Um, on related work looking at um, DNA dynamics in, um, in the cytoskeleton, but then more importantly, to actually work on this. So, you know, we still really were interested in this, this uh, idea, but we didn't have enough money from the Scilog to really make it happen. Um, we just got enough to get some preliminary data. Um, uh, then we applied for one of these wacky Keck grants. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so because we had applied for an NSF grant, and they said, this isn't gonna work. Um, you know, why, are you, you know, you must be kidding us. Um, and so then we thought, well, okay, let's, let's see if Keck likes the idea. And sure enough, they did. And they, one of the things that the Keck Foundation asked for to see the reviews from our NSF grant, because we, you have to say if you've applied for grant somewhere. And so we, we showed them that basically they all said, this is really awesome if you could do this, but you're not gonna be able to. Um, and so since so we, we got this in 2018 and we've been working on it. Um, so we've been working on it since then and it's really exciting. It's really starting to come together. So I, we actually think it's going to work, um, which is awesome. And, um, and another, uh, probably running short on time, um, but just another important, um, Piece, another important aspect of the relationship that I've had with Research Corporation is um, is the funding. So, so a couple years ago, they started uh, offering grants you could apply to do to form regional conferences for the Cottrell Scholars Program. Um, and so, uh, we so a colleague of mine, P. D. Avini, in in chemistry and biochemistry, and myself, uh, you know, submitted an application to to form a uh, conference on soft matter and hosted at USD. And we did that into, and so again, Research Corporation said, sure, we can give you some money for that. Um, and it was, and we, we did this conference in 2018 and then it was really successful. So we asked if we could do it again. And sure enough, they said yes. Um, but this, this, this experience has been really wonderful for forming more collaborations among um, among colleagues and having a connection between undergraduate institutions and research um, research universities and just just building more of this community. So one one thing I really love about research corporation and private foundations is it feels very much like a family. You know, you're not just a paper proposal that you've submitted and and you know you never get to meet the program officer. It's very much about like um, keeping in touch and building a relationship and a network and a family and helping you throughout your 
your career. So I think that's really, really important. Um, and so with that, I can wrap up. But so basically where we're going from here is now that, you know, um, we're moving. So now my lab is moving more into active materials now that we've um, we have a lot of the toolboxes in place and developing more of these micro scale techniques because one question if you can create active these active creepy crawling materials how are you going to characterize what they're doing um, and so there we need some more technique development so that's what we're working on now but again it was all possible just because of that first seed grant from research corporation and also just continuing to work with undergraduates because um, and in and the Keck Foundation too was very supportive of you know, of the undergraduates, the work that they were doing, the work that they're doing in the lab and the research corporation. And not all, it's not necessarily appreciated by, by federal funding. And with that, I'd just like to thank, um, thank uh, the funding, thank Research Corporation and the Cottrell Scholars Collaborative for what they've done for my career. And the other, um, particularly the, you know, the private foundations, the Gordon and Medi Moore Foundation and the Keck Foundation um, and some of the other, and, the other the uh, um, other federal agencies. So, thank you. Yeah.